<laughs> wow, okay, that's a lot of people. Thank you all for joining. So, um, I prepared no slides. I'm just gonna show this all directly in Blender. But first off, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Julian Kasper. I work at the Blender studio, uh, mainly as a character artist for modeling, sculpting, and other tasks. Uh, so I worked on previous open movie projects like Spring, Coffee Run, uh, Settlers, and then also the latest production that uh, is currently called Project Heist. Um, so in those productions, we went through various different styles, and I wanted to uh, present some of that knowledge that was, and some of the lessons that were learned from there uh, in this talk. I, I actually wanted to make this presentation like two years ago, when I thought, oh yeah, 2020, there's gonna be the next Blender conference. The year before that, I did a live sculpting session, and uh, I knew I wanted to do a live retopology session the, the following year. Uh, well, this took a bit longer. Uh, this is actually interesting that like, um, I, I really like retopology. This is like something I enjoyed for a long time. And I remember that like, I didn't actually open this in the tabs, but um, uh, if you search on YouTube for Blender Conference uh, retopology, you're gonna find the uh, presentations from Jonathan Williamson, which are now like, oh, one is 10 years ago. And I remember watching these back in the day when I was still learning modeling. And these were incredibly insightful. Uh, I love the information even still today. I think this is a um, great basis of, of this uh, talk even. And um, I wanted this sort of live retopology at the Blender conference to continue. So this is maybe a bit, little bit of my continuation of it. Um, so thanks a lot, Jonathan. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yes, but for this, uh, um, uh, I wanted, I guess like what I wanted to focus on this time is not like general retopology or modeling workflows, but something that is more close to the uh, actual film production at the Blender Studio. Um, and I actually thought maybe I can do a full retopology of a character, show something about uh, various different aspects, but I, I rehearsed this and I was like, okay, I can do at most facial retopology. So this is like one of the examples that I did uh, over a year ago. Um, for my course at the Blender Studio website. But if I compare this, this is the actual retopology that was used for the character Rain, which can be downloaded for free online. This is fully rigged. But this was also um, a character that was directly going into, um, that was directly a learning ground for me of how can I optimize retopology. And it's really interesting because retopology is sort of a puzzle. Um, you, re you usually start from some sort of design, if it's a 2D concept or already a finished sculpt, and then you try to uh, make an optimized mesh out of that while still capturing all of the shapes, the creases, all the surface details that you need in the actual mesh. And ideally you want those, uh, uh, those shapes and those details to shine, to really be represented in both the subdivided and the low poly version. Um, uh, you want to make it easy to select stuff of the, in the retopology that any rigger or anyone who needs to work on this can very easily select loops and parts of the geometry. Very easy, it needs, should be easy to work with and it should be performant. So um, whatever you're building shouldn't be too high poly because that might just end up uh, being too taxing on either the viewport performance or maybe even final rendering if you are having a lot of crowded characters in the background or depends on what you're actually aiming to do. Um, so based on that, the, this puzzle has many different solutions. And I think it's actually interesting that every time I do a retopology, the result tends to be very different. Um, because I think it's once you actually abide to some principles or know what you're actually aiming for, it's hard to really go wrong. Um, which doesn't mean it's super easy, but it's, uh, it, it becomes less confusing. Um, 
And in this file, for example, I actually put in a bunch of examples. This is the first one. And I, I think the, like, I can enable some colors over here. Uh, this was sort of like one of the first sample uh, topologies that I created just uh, to experiment how um, clean can you make it. Um, I, I love it when people show actually online uh, their, their retopologies and you can see that it's it's very very well flowing in a certain direction. You can it's very easy to dissect and it's very easy to showcase with these colors. They're very clearly defined circular and square patches. Um, so um, this also makes the retopology fairly generic. You could use this sort of um, uh, setup for various different characters. Uh, especially when you're uh, going for a more cartoony or stylized style where there's less of a difference between the different characters. Um, uh, but yes, uh, the interesting thing is uh, typically you don't, I don't just start from uh, a finished sculpt or a design before I go into retopology. I started to uh, really like going into some exploration, some more experimentation before committing to uh, the topology. And um, I actually uh, usually, for example, for the character Rain, I did a bunch of expression tests, which are all just sculpted on top of a very, very temporary topology that was just meant for multi-resolution sculpting. But this, uh, these sorts of experimentations already give you a bit of insight of what expressions are needed, where creases need to form in the face, and uh, what actually works with the style that you're going for. So uh, it, it turns out very uh, informative, and I did this also then for the follow-up character. And um, especially for movie productions like Sprite Fright, where the characters tend to be very cartoony, very simplified, you realize what is even required of the topology. What are, what do you, where do you need creases to form, or do you even need any variation in the surface uh, details? Um, so this is all sort of style exploration, and you can create a style guide from this, which will be massively influ influential for the retopology. Um, if I go back to Blender, uh, the wrong one, um, I actually, I can um, hide the wireframes for a bit. I actually set up some grease pencil lines over here to kind of dissect how I tend to think about topology, because, uh, retopology, especially for the face. Um, because uh, there's more behind it, but I think it can be very easily broken down into specific uh, requirements. And then from that, you can already use that as a starting point if needed to uh, build the topology from that. So first off, I like to think of the general edge flow. And I think this is something fairly universal. Uh, for, for the most part, humans tend to have the same edge flow. So you have... Uh, this tends to follow the general shapes of the face, the, the general forms, uh, but also uh, something like muscle movements. So if you know that there's going to be movements around the mouth and the eyes in a certain direction, uh, you can be fairly certain that the uh, loops of the topology should follow this flow. So this is kind of a, a nice a guideline to take as the, the fundamental basis. So there's like a loop going around the eyes, around the nose, well, up then probably also the nose holes, the mouth, and then uh, very importantly around the nasolobial fold over here where creases tend to form very often. Um, but then from there, uh, you can start to kind of dissect the, the shapes of the actual face. Because in here, I was from the sculpt, I was able to determine, okay, there are specific creases, hard-edged lines that go across the face. And these should always be visible. These uh, can already be hard modeled into the topology. So once you subdivide it, you will always have a nice hard crease in these areas. Um, but this also starts to quickly include secondary creases, which are not visible by default, but 
This is where uh, you really start to draw from the expression tests and uh, whatever else you have for the expressions for the style expiration, where you can see there are certain areas in the face where you want creases to form. Uh, that could be especially around the nasolobial uh, line over here, uh, on the mouth and the eyes. If you're like, look, if if she's looking angry or compressing her forehead or like squishing, compressing different areas of the face. Um, and what these areas typically need is like one loop directly on the crease where it needs to form or it needs to already exist, and then two proximity loops right next to it. And in the case for the secondary creases, these proximity loops can then be re via the rig squished together and you can get that nice crease anytime you need it. Um, uh, something I found out uh, um, after looking up uh, Brian Tyndall and his educational material, which I found actually quite fascinating, is uh, the, his theory on articulation. So there is uh, a sort of an ideal st a minimum amount of loops that you could follow, that you can abide by uh, when it comes to the eyes, the eyebrows, and the mouth. Uh, typically those areas need a lot of deformation, a lot of different shapes that you want to achieve. And it's interesting that if you want to have a lot of freedom for creating these shapes, um, you can imagine, like for example with, uh, with the eyebrow, that just like with a rig, you typically t tend to have like three controls to control the end, the middle, uh, the start, the middle, and the end. Um, this gives you already a lot of freedom, but uh, to uh, offer even more possibilities f to, to control this, basically this curve, is to give each of these control points, like to treat, as, treat it actually like a curve with two handles. So each of these control points would have two handles to it, and each of these can then be very individually controlled and actually moved around. Gives a huge amount of freedom, but this uh, gives you an idea of how many loops you actually need here, because you need these three loops over here, and then two proximity loops next to it to act as the handles. And this can then directly match up with a rig to deform these areas very freely. The same then goes for the eyes over here, uh, including, in this case, two additional ends over here, um, uh, which then just like kind of splits the top and the bottom half, which ideally should be symmetrical. And then the same for the mouth. Um, the other thing which we very <laughs> strongly needed to take into consideration for uh, Sprite Fright, where we had very extreme deformations of the mouth uh, region, is how far do f certain features actually need to move? Uh, this is something you really should be aware of, because depending on where you place poles or how your uh, loops actually are directed, uh, you might not be able to move the mouth corners that far later on. So this is actually very helpful to keep in mind. And then the last thing that I kind of like to um, uh, work with is what I call landmarks. And this is um, typically, especially for cartoony and stylized styles, or even if you just have a simplified version of a, of a model for the rig, you have a geometry that represents, for example, the eyebrows. And uh, in order for the eyebrows, the eyebrow, eyebrow object, to move in perfect unison with the underlying skin, these areas should have ideally the same topology. So you can anchor these objects perfectly on the underlying object so they can move together. Um, all of this gives you a sort of map of what you actually want to do, what is required of this character. And it's actually fascinating that, uh, uh, like, I, I just set this up for, for rain over here, and we can actually have this in comparison with the actual topology. Um, but then I kept going, and I tried the same thing for, for example, Snow, which was uh, the follow-up character, same style, but in this case, I tried a bit of a different topology. Um, unlike with rain, 
where you can see that uh, everything is kind of neatly flowing into each other. Each pole is via an edge loop connected to another pole, so you can very easily color these areas. Uh, when you look at snow, it's actually a bit different. If I go into, over here into edit mode, uh, the seams over here are kind of indicating where the different poles are sort of leading into each other, and it's, a, it's not as clean, it's not as clear cut. But because I started with this topology to more uh, tailor the individual edge loops and the patches to his facial features, I was able to uh, add some more, like highlight some more features like his pronounced chin and uh, the different look of his ears, but also his more boxy um, forehead. Um, and all of that with basically almost half of the amount of topology that I had for Rain with the first character. Um, so this is all a bit more custom tailored to this design, uh, but it is more optimized. Um, but overall, it still had very much the same requirements, similar amount of, uh, of uh, uh, well, the extent where certain features need to move and where certain hard edges are placed. Uh, Rex over here from Sprite Fright is a very interesting counterexample because based on the red line over here, you can see that his mouth was supposed to extend very far into a lot of different directions and it, it's kind of insane. Um, we did this thing with like a cut out mouth style so you can actually see uh, not just that the mouth is really big but we were playing with the silhouette of the other side of the mouth to make it really cartoony. Um, and uh, also something is missing here. There's not a single secondary crease. Uh, for this particular design uh, in the movie, we wanted to keep the, this, this sort of bucket head shape uh, to be consistent and to have no fleshy creases form. We actually had a different system to create fake two-dimensional creases on top. So this was completely not required by the topology. Um, this, is, this topology was made by uh, Angela Jeanette and it was super good uh, based on some expression tests we found out how easy it is to break the mesh if you try to make a huge mouth and you can see that based on these uh, loops the, they are basically following all around in this circular pattern and only up here in the cheek area do you see these poles which are sort of accumulating where stuff tends to not move. Uh, so this was very tailor-made to this character, but other principles still say, sort of stayed the same. Um, uh, going further, this is uh, Einar from uh, Project Heist, and uh, with this we went more for a realistic style, which is very different. Um, if I disable over here the other objects, this is uh, the whole face. And just looking at the topology, it is actually fairly generic. It's kind of going a bit back to the topology that I did for the first character, Rain, um, only not as high density. But looking at the different grease pencil lines that I did here, um, the expression boundaries, the red line, uh, doesn't extend very far because it's very realistic. You can kind of expect what you need from this character. but. Interestingly, there's, there's no landmarks because uh, we didn't need any objects that move in perfect unison with the, with the skin underneath because we were just adding particles on top. We were adding uh, new curve objects for uh, spawning all of the hair. And um, there's also no creases, not even secondary creases because uh, we, I, I actually ended up taking this as uh, a base for further sculpting, and all of the details were baked onto the slow poly mesh. So you can just capture all of these details with a displacement modifier, with or extra extra height maps for shading, and um, you don't really need to represent all of that in the low poly model. Uh, even the animators could use uh, EV or some textured preview to display uh, further details. Um, so this actually tends to be a very simple topology for realistic characters. And over here I have an example uh, with the actual baked version where if I 
switch between these uh, these sliders, it, it actually blends in different shape keys and uh, displacement maps and bump maps. So you can start to blend in all of these details and these differences just via the shader and modifiers. So all of that is sort of offloaded from the retopology. But looking at this, I, I actually didn't even make a custom retopology, uh, a retopology for this character. What I did is uh, earlier that year, I uh, created sculpting base meshes, which have like this very even, um, very well distributed topology. And I used, just, I used this as a base. I just sort of shrink wrapped it onto the sculpt of, of this realistic character, made a couple of adjustments, and just made sure that the loops uh, line up with his facial features, and that was it. So um, that's actually the great thing with uh, realistic characters, because we all tend to have very similar features and proportions. It's very easy to recycle the uh, very well done retopology, even like a halfway decently done retopology, you can just like slap it onto a different character and it could still work. Or at least it could w save you a lot of time because you don't need to make a new topology from scratch. Um, so that's basically that. Uh, what I want to do for the rest of the, these 50 minutes is to actually do a bit of a live demonstration of how I go about retopologizing. And for that, I actually snatched a different character that I sculpted in uh, a live, uh, in a bunch of live streams uh, like a year ago. Uh, by the way, if you're more interested in like uh, retopology examples, there's uh, courses online on the Blender Studio website. Uh, I also published a bunch of uh, doc uh, documentation on what we learned from creating realistic characters and w what went well and what went wrong, uh, what we learned. Um, and then there's like a whole playlist on the Blender Studio channel on live streams that I made live. So uh, this, is th this talk is a bit of a compressed version of what I'm showing there, uh, you could say. Um, but before I could even start retopologizing this character, I needed to straighten out some things. So in this case, I made a bit of a T-pose of this character. I removed the hair because uh, it's getting a bit in the way, and I also I, I'm not going to cover it uh, in, in this session. Um, and then uh, from here, I actually went through the same task of just sort of outlining the different requirements that I have for this. One moment. Um, this means I, I actually made up some things. I, I just sort of, let's say, I, I, let's assume I actually made some expression sculpts. We did some concepting, some more testing, and we actually know what we need of the three topology for it to work. And uh, for that, I just, uh, for, for example, the general edge flow over here. An interesting difference here is that, you, that we kind of need to abide to some circular loops over here around the ear and basically also around the horns. Um, and then the mouth is, uh, is a bit more complicated because it's, it's made of such different features. Um, there's the, uh, the main creases, uh, which you can very easily see already on the sculpt. And I'm just going to assume that this is a very cartoony animation style. So uh, I'm not going to add any more um, creases that would highlight like the eyelids or something like that. But it's all rather flat and simple. Um, and then uh, I drew in all of these secondary creases. And this is just like what I could imagine forming from all kinds of expressions that this character could do. Uh, interestingly, because um, uh, Michelle over here, which is the, the name of the character, um, uh, doesn't have eyebrows, I just kind of imagine that there would be creases forming whenever uh, he would look mad or worried. So uh, this would also need some extra cr uh, topology over here that would form. Uh, then same th story again here for the articulation, for the eyebrows we need the three uh, handle loops, and then the same uh, set, sort of setup for the mouth and the eyes. Um, 
for the expression boundaries, I would just say, okay, so similar as with the sprite fright characters, it, the mouth can mm, deform very wide and in lots of different directions. And the same could also be the case for the eyes. Let's say when he's shocked, like his eyes could expand, so they need a bit more space. And uh, the only place where they would collide is directly here when they would meet with the mouth. So that is a bit of a limitation there. And landmarks is really just, uh, there needs to be some connection point to the, uh, to the horns. You would want to move these perfectly together, no swimming of uh, uh, topology, of moving objects around. They really need to be pinned to these objects. Same thing for the tag over here on the ear. Um, and again, this gives us sort of an, a nice indication of a map. So. With this, I would just turn down the opacity of this over here and actually also turn down the stroke, si stroke thickness. So I still kind of have this reminder over here. And I already have a, an object set up over here for the retopology. Um, and from here, I would just start. Uh, first off, I'm gonna go into workbench shading, solid shading, because the EV lighting can be a bit distracting. Uh, there's already a bunch of modifiers set up. I'm gonna get, actually get rid of these two. But mostly it's just like a mirror modifier with clipping enabled, uh, a shrink wrap modifier set to project because uh, that can uh, make sure that the even with face snapping on, everything always stays on the mesh that I'm snapping to. And then on top of that, a subdiv modifier to see the actual final results in uh, object mode. Um, but yeah. Uh, one moment. Okay, so basically, I mean, a lot of people like to sort of start off with, if I disable clipping over here, start off with just the general eye area. And I think that's actually quite fair. I think eyes and mouth, the mouth are uh, fairly um, default. You can, uh, you kind of know what to expect, and then the rest kind of uh, comes out after that. So in this case, I'm basically, I know there's like many different modeling workflows out there of how you can work. There's like great add-ons that uh, make retopology a lot easier. For this case, I'm basically just sort of going to stick to my own workflow. Uh, I encourage everyone to just sort of do the same thing and see what works for them. Um, but uh, I, I actually used, uh, I actually tend to use the tools over here on the side by to keep them active. You, I use Tweak a lot. Um, so uh, over here, so first off, I'm sort of following the articulation loops of where I need certain uh, topology to be. Uh, from here on, what I like to do actually is to, uh, hold on, um, to make sure that both the top side and the bottom side always stay symmetrical. And for that, I'm just kind of merging this area over here. Uh, I'm adding one more loop over here in the center and uh, this sort of leads to these diamond loops over here, which is a bit problematic because if you st start to add an edge loop over here, it uh, it doesn't tend to stay uh, well symmetrical correctly. I want to keep the top and the bottom side symmetrical when inserting new loops. So over here, what I like to do is I'm going to select these two and split this with J and then I'm going to subdivide them, which creates this little two pole over here, like a, a pole with two connected edges. And if I now add an edge loop on one side, it will always make sure that it's uh, going through to the bottom side as well. And this little pole over here, I would just get rid of later on. I don't really need it for the final retopology. This is just a, a tool for myself to work with. Um, what I also like to do is any sort of important loops that I really need, I like to highlight them with uh, either as a seam or as a sharp. 
uh, it reminds me of what loops are actually really important um, and I want to keep sticking around. But for the most part, I don't bother too much about where exactly everything is placed. I just really want to think about right now about what is the general topology that I need. So over here, I could also uh, extrude this up for the eyebrows. And in this case, this loop, this loop, and this loop could be the main articulation handles, which means these loops over here are, connect, are basically meant for this one. These are the proximity loops to the mid. This is a proximity loop to this start, and I can just create a new one over here. Let's actually merge these, and a similar thing over here. Right, then I can just stop with this area for now and continue with the rest. So I will just continue with the mouth and sort of do the same thing. First the articulation areas. Oh, well, well, well. Uh, there we go. <laughs> this got a bit weird. <laughs> I'm just going to delete this area. Right. Like that. These are the important ones. I'm just going to highlight them. We're as a seam, uh, not a sharp, as a seam. And then I can, well, first off, merge these areas, insert another edge loop over here, and I'm going to do the same thing with the two pole over here. So if I ever add an edge loop over here, it just gets transfer, transferred to the bottom. Right. And then from there, I can add the additional loops that I need for the articulation, which I already have over here. And what I'm not even bothering with right now is the creases. Um, anything, like I want the, uh, the edges to already follow this, uh, this uh, general flow but I don't want to add any proximity loops for uh, any primary or secondary creases to capture any details because that will be so much easier to set up later on. Right now I just want to create these different areas, these different, well, edge loops. Um, I'm also going to disable the mirror modifier for now. Same thing over here. So there would be like a loop going on over here. And it would meet up in the middle. Like that. Um, there's also going to be like, you see like because of the viewport shading, you're going to see all of the back facing uh, topology on the back of the head. What I actually like to do, I got this tip at some point, is to add a solidify modifier. This is a bit of a, of a cheat, but if you add a bit of thickness over here, you actually can uh, obscure the back sides, uh, which in this case actually does not quite end up correctly. I can invert the normals, and then it should be fine. So it's less distracting. Exactly. So, um, oof. <laughs> let's see. Um, I also, uh, 
really don't want to bother too much about pushing vertices at this point. It really shouldn't be that important. What is just important is that uh, there's a certain amount of loops that supports the lines that I've already drawn over here. So there's like a loop going on over here, which then leads into this one. And then I can fill in this also over here. This can be uh, very crude, very simple. Just continue right here. And then over here, I can just like start adding more edge loops like that. And everything is like, like uh, very jagged and unevenly placed. But I'm going to get to that later. Trying to make everything perfect from the start is just going to be a bit distracting. So over here, I can also already sort of merge this. I could even add an edge loop over here. But even just like adding more loops later on to more evenly distribute uh, the topology is fairly easy to do. So I don't need to do that now. And over here, right. Okay. Right, I'm actually going to uh, start building the nulls. I also don't need to have everything connected all the time as I'm building it. I can build different little islands and stitch them together later on as I need to so that I can keep my focus on individual areas, make sure that they have all the loops, all the necessary things for them. So over here, I can just extrude this, be fairly free with that. And then over here, I can already start to fill this in, move this down. Sort of like that. Right. Uh, what I could do over here is also to just like spiral this a bit into the nose. This is completely fine. It's like it it creates a bit of a messier, uh, well, uh, flow in the different face loops, but it can save you on some complexity. There we go. Now this is interesting. I, I set up the, the like desired amount of loops for the mouth and the eyes, but I would say that it's more of a minimum necessary amount of loops. In this case over here, because this is also a crease, I would really need to highlight this one as well. And I think the, the easiest way in this case would be, for example, to just sort of add an edge loop over here um, highlight this area, and then over here, this can be uh, fanned out and dispersed a bit more. Um, what I love to use is to actually go into scope mode. In this case, I could just disable these modifiers real quick. Um, what's going on over here? Oh, right. Oh, it's actually, yes, it was, the normals were flipped. So in this case, I can go to sculpt mode. And I love the slide relax brush. This is sort of a smoothing and, and moving brush, but it keeps the, it tries to keep the actual shape of the object intact as you're moving and sliding things around. So this becomes actually really useful for retopology where once you actually want to disperse some of this topology a bit more to have it more evenly distributed, you can just smooth over it, which in 
some cases though means that certain loops will slide a bit out of place and into maybe directions that you didn't want to. But it can save a lot of time. You don't need to create this perfect pixel, uh, like perfect vertex pushing at the start. You can create this as you go along. And I am rushing this a bit, like I am trying to get through the different points. In reality, I would like give myself a bit more time to really um, do this retopology as, uh, as safe as possible because eventually, once you start connecting things, you can actually uh, get yourself a bit in trouble where some loops are weirdly flowing into others and you need to resolve some conflicts and uh, keeping this all separated for quite a while actually makes this very easy to manage. It's something that I very, very typically do with the uh, retopology of the body, that I would retopologize the hand, the arms, the, uh, each individual limb as by itself, and then only afterwards I, I, I'm going to, or even while I'm doing it, I'm going to compare how these uh, limbs could connect, and then I can still reduce the amount of loops and uh, manage this a bit more before I actually start merging and connecting geometry. Over here, I think this is also still kind of interesting with this crease, because this starts to, all of these different lines start to kind of conflict with each other a bit. So over here, I could just sort of extrude these uh, face loops over here. Now over here, I, I'm actually going to mark these now. So these are like the different uh, sharp uh, edges. So this is also what I tend to like to do, is mark these as sharp. So I know that these need to actually the, be or become a sharp edge with proximity, pro proximity loops attached to them. Um, so, over here, this is actually quite interesting. So, the, these are sort of starting to collide a bit, and what I could do is I could create a diamond over here. So I have the two proximity loops to create this crease later in the animation, but they're terminating over here. And then what I need to just resolve is I need to somehow make these pieces connect. Um, in this case, it's completely okay if you run out of loops, if you run out of options to potentially also uh, add more edge loops, but uh, I'm gonna try to do it just with what I have right now. So over here I could like move this all together um, but in this case, I'm actually going to uh, separate this again. I'm going to keep one in between, just so this, the, this proximity loop over here is, and this one here, they're sort of like belonging to this crease. But this over here is, these are the loops for the eyebrows. So they're, they're kind of left alone. Oh, what happened? What, what happened? Oh no. Okay, there we go. And now I can just keep filling this in. It can be a little pole over here even, but this is the thing, like these poles over here, vertices with five or more connected edges, or well, more than four or less than four, uh, try to first of all place them in, in areas where there's very little movement. Uh, I think that's a very good rule of thumb because they will typically cause some strange stretching or compression um, by default, pretty much when subdivided. Um, but uh, also, these poles over here, it would be great to not place them directly on a crease. So what I, for example, at some point would do is, uh, let's say I want to add two proximity loops to this 
crease over here. Um, I don't, sometimes I don't want to add like two additional edge loops that are just like flowing around the entire topology somewhere where I don't want it to be. I, I can keep it actually fairly isolated and instead I can just take this um, and just bevel it with one edge loop in the center and just make sure that, um, well, let's actually try this again, but one further, beveling this, adding one edge loop in the center, and I'm gonna merge these into one and get rid of, like, collapse this, uh, this edge over here so it ends in a diamond. And this is sort of the same thing that I did up here. So this area is, I can relax it by default. So all the necessary loops are basically there, but they don't like start to go across the entire topology. Uh, you, can, and you can keep the amount of density reduced with these diamond uh, uh, quads. Um, also something, I, I, I typically like to use scope mode to push stuff around, but as you can see, the edit mode shading disappears. Like you don't see anymore what was marked as a sharp or a, a seam. Uh, I guess the most class, more classic workflow is to actually use the tweak tool or like tweaking in general and using that together with proportional editing. And that can also have somewhat the effect of using a brush because it adds a radius to it. And then you can start pushing this around. If I wanted to, I could add uh, some more loops over here. Um, it's fine for the, I would say for the articulation areas, it's fine if the left and the right side are asymmetrical, but ideally you should keep the top and the bottom side symmetrical. It makes it really easy to, uh, if I have still the examples over here, to have the upper and the lower eyelid or lip match each other. So you can very easily create a closed eye shape. Uh, or even just for the riggers and animators, it's very easy to recognize where those need to go. Um, um, as a little tip, just like in terms of if you should actually retopologize the model in with closed eyes or open eyes, I guess that kind of depends on what is the most like the, the default state of the eyes that you usually see. Uh, if you see the eyes mostly open and blinking is just like very temporary, very short, you could just as well retopologize it with, with open, completely open eyes, it's fine. Um, that can still lead to perfectly fine UV maps, shading. Um, I guess what I tend to lean towards is actually sort of half open eyes um, but I like to hand over the retopology at the end of it uh, of my task to rigging and animation tests with uh, additional shape keys for open and closed eyes, uh, so that there is some more references for the next departments to work on the next people. Um, but I am basically running out of time, I think. So I didn't quite get that far, <laughs> but uh, I hope you can see where I'm sort of going with this. Um, there are certain loops that are most important, but for example, when I would get to the cheek over here, uh, I really don't care that much. Like, I think certain areas for the face tend to just be like one big square patch of topology. And as long as it has enough resolution to create certain deformations, like let's say the character needs a particular shape for uh, puffing their cheeks, uh, and you know that they need a lot of, uh, co the rig needs a lot of control there, then you need to add a certain amount of density to that area, uh, providing the loops so they can actually control that shape. But other than that, there's not a particular flow that is necessary here. So I just tend to leave it as fairly square, fill it in with the rest, uh, and be done with it. <laughs> um, but this is sort of the workflow. Um, uh, and I hope that can be sort of recognized in these characters over here in the retopologies. 
um, if I go into edit mode here, you can see the same sort of thing started happening here, where you can see which loops were most important, where certain features uh, begin, need to be accentuated or end. And uh, as long as you keep this baseline in mind, even if you go a bit too high or a bit too low in topology, it doesn't quite matter. Like it's, uh, you can still get a lot out of, a, out of the retopology as long as the most important features are captured. Um, right, uh, I would say that would be it then. Uh, I would I would close it here. <laughs>